This story was shared on 4chan's X board in October 2014. The op identified himself as a 19-year-old from Arizona. Be advised the content is particularly real and upsetting and might ring too close to home for some readers. When I was young I had to live with my dad in a caravan park in the desert at the edge of some dirt poor hick town. Pick sadly related. The people there were basically 100% white trash burnouts, the most depressing kind of environment for a kid to grow up in. Dad was alright. He drank but wasn't angry, worked a lot and didn't really care what I did. He was a demolition worker and would sometimes be gone for days at a time. During these times I would stay in this one van with a family of three who we were pretty close to. There was the dad, John, and the two sons, one my age, Michael, and one a year younger, who, no shit, was called Dog. Now even in that setting Dog was a weird name. Like there were literally people with the name Cletus there and even they laughed at the name Dog. But the family was really nice nonetheless. I hardly saw the dad because he worked and drank like my own father so it was usually me, Michael and Dog mucking around at the caravan camp doing whatever we liked. Michael and Dog were nice kids but I'd had a little bit of education having spent a few years with my mom in the city and by comparison these kids were pretty simple. Their idea of fun was catching lizards and mashing them up with sticks. Which was a good way to kill time, though. They also had a PS1 with some games but it always glitched out. The main thing I remember about hanging around them was the smell of their caravan in the heat. This really rancid stench would build up as we played PlayStation or mashed lizards or whatever, the hotter the day the worse it was. So one day I asked them what the smell was all about and they said they'd show me. So they take me into the back section of the caravan which is cordoned off from the rest by one of those sparkly bead curtains and that's how I found out their dad was into taxidermy. There were buckets of roadkill and his taxidermy handiwork lined the walls. The windows had been fully taped over with black duct tape and it was actually bubbling in the heat, leaking this thick plastic type smell that mixed in with the smell of meat. I saw most of the taxidermied animals were lizards and realized why they were all about killing lizards. I was creeped out but after a time I didn't notice the stench so bad and became interested in how well crafted the animals were. The sculptures all had real craftsmanship and talent, or so I thought as a kid, in retrospect they were pretty crude. So I'm admiring the taxidermy when the door slams shut and I almost chid myself when John is standing over me staring hard at me and his kids, but then he just bursts out smiling and acting like a giddy child eager to know what I think. He seemed so happy when I said I liked it. I genuinely did like it too, as a kid you sort of don't have a broad enough awareness of social norms to know that taxidermy is pretty creepy. Another thing I didn't notice at the time was that even though he was incredibly nice and warm to his sons, they both acted totally submissive and treated his every word as an order. When he asked if I would like a beer, for instance, they both said yes sir in tune and rushed to the fridge. But he just laughed and they were smiling so I didn't suspect anything was wrong. That night we made a small fire outside and all got drunk. Me Michael and Dog were kids so it didn't take much. We huddled around the fire as John enthusiastically started telling us the story of how a dog was born. He'd had a truly beautiful mother, he said, who loved Michael more than the world. Michael didn't remember his mother and the story made him sad. Their mother and John had lived in a nice house in a different state, and when she got pregnant a second time it was like a miracle, he said. Then a glaze crossed over his eyes and his voice got whimpery. But before the dog was born, the mother had buckled to the floor and blood was coming out of her. And when they got to the hospital, no sooner had the dog been born was she dead. We all got a bit teary-eyed, John especially. He hugged his son's dog. Mommy died so we could have you my baby boy he said and his son cried. 
They both cried and held each other. But I noticed Michael was smiling widely. He turned to me and said daddy's going to make everything all right again. Hearing him his father nodded and repeated like a chant, yes, soon I will make everything all right again. And they had me join them in a family hug. As we hugged something bad happened. John suddenly yelled and thrust us all off him. He smashed his bottle on the ground and started breathing heavily. Dog tentatively approached him and started asking what was wrong. His father turned to him with wild eyes as bright as the fire and screamed at him not to talk like that, what did I tell you about talking, dog? Dog started stammering, falling over his own feet into the gravel. I was too woozy to think straight and as I watched this horrible sign Michael put his hand on my knee and squeezed. John approached the boy and hit him on the neck until he cried out in protest, making John hit him again and scream. What did I tell you dogs? Don't. Talk. And the dog, on his hands and knees, tears running down his face, started whimpering like a pup. And then he was barking. And then howling. John hit him again on the neck and said louder. Dog, living up to his namesake, frantically whooped and barked, running around in the sand on all fours. John seemed happy with this and seized the boy under the stomach. He sharply ordered his other son to follow and they disappeared inside. Before he left Michael shot me a big grin, the same smile he'd given when he said everything would be alright. For a long time I didn't see them. I told my father about what happened and he said he'd talk to John about his drinking but that was all he could do. You can't tell people what's good for them, he said resignedly. I saw Michael a couple more times, killing lizards behind my caravan. We exchanged hellos but nothing more. Then I saw him one more time, a few days later, on one of the hottest days I remember. He looked really satisfied and was strutting around the caravan lot whistling to himself. When I approached I saw that he was holding a small blade, glinting with fresh redness. Killing lizards I asked tentatively. He winked, grinned big and said. Just making some final adjustments. And he walked off. As he did so I heard a slow awful moan from behind their caravan. It was the guttural wail of an animal. But before I could reach it there was the sound of the door slamming, and only twin peaks of blood droplets were left in the sand. Many weeks passed. One day, I was home alone when there was a knock at the door. I opened it and saw John, standing, and smiling. His appearance struck an instant unease in me, but he started apologizing for the night I had witnessed, and seemed very genuine. He talked about how his drinking was out of hand and he really shouldn't have gone off around me. He wanted me to know that things were finally getting better, and wanted me to come over and see them all. Half out of fear, half out of childish naivete I followed him. I really am sorry, he should know not to act that way. He kept saying, but things are finally getting back to normal. It's been a long road, and a hard one, but things are finally coming full circle. I noted that now all the windows had been blacked out. He opened the door and shut it behind me. Inside it smelled worse than ever. I almost gagged at the fecal stench, the burned plastic and mincemeat. And it was hard to see too, the whole place was dimmed out through the taped up windows. A cloud of foul-smelling steam hung in the air. I looked down and saw Michael, casually sprawled on a mattress playing PlayStation, as if unaware of the changes. He was excited to see me. Hey man. Things have gotten so much better. It's been a long road, and a hard one, but it's finally getting back to the way things were. He was grinning like he could hardly contain himself. Him and his father kept exchanging sneaky smiles. I noticed he was wearing a shirt and pants many sizes too big for him. Who's up for a beer he announced. 
his dad jokingly responded yes sir, man of the house. And bent down to get some cans out. Michael shot me a look like we were both in on a big joke. I tried to ignore the noises coming from behind the bead curtain, but he sensed it on me and said. Wait till you see it. Our brand new dog. Michael passed through the curtain in a few steps. I felt John press a cold beer into my hand and his palm against my back pushing me through the beads and into the taxidermy room. The smell was all pervading. Bowls of meat lay around the floor, some visibly glistening with maggots. The buzzing of flies half melted into the window filled the place. And in the corner of the room, overlooked by the stuffed heads of the animals, was a kennel. The rest was like a fever dream. Michael's voice was insonorous and far away as he said out, dog, out. John stood in the corner, pride swelling in his face. And then it was shuffling out of its kennel, one paw after the next the brand new dog. It was John's best work by far. The unsteady, wobbling walk was achieved through two cuts to the wrists and ankles, very small. I remembered the blade and the droplets in the sand. His hands and feet dragged pathetically behind him as he lurched forward. A diagram of wires covered the body performing functions I could only guess at. The back was bent into the curved shape of a dog, and the head jutted forward from a neck and meshed in chicken wire and wounds. But the face was a masterpiece. The jaws had been stretched out in a contraption looking like a mouth guard, that sturdied itself with thick pylons in the gums, split down the middle so the entire tongue was permanently flapping out, dripping the nose had been, it seemed, flattened into shape, and the open nasal cavities were thickly coated with wetness. The ears, dragged back towards the shoulders with chicken wire, were now long and pointed, stretching the whole head into a brand new shape. The only thing that remained untouched were dog's terrified eyes, from which I saw were bleeding streams of tears. Good boy, Michael was saying, kneeling to dog's level, that's a good dog. Then he struck it on the back so that it buckled over. Stop that. He ordered, dogs don't cry. Well trained, dog let out a series of woeful howls. Michael, pleased pushed a bowl towards him, and dog, eyes unblinking, eagerly dipped his face straight into it and lapped it up. Michael and John stood side by side, the father with his hand on his son's shoulder. You did great, son, John said, everything's almost alright again. Everything will be back to normal now. Michael nodded. Now son, it's time to put down the dog. John gingerly helped his son grip the rifle steady, helping his fingers around the grip and the trigger. I couldn't move. Not even a foot away from me dog was lapping up the slope, his extended snout dripping with rotten meat. I could feel the heat of his body. I was so close Michael steadied himself with the big gun, obviously not used to its weight. He stumbled back once, his father gently helped him back up. I couldn't feel my own body anymore. Only the smell, the heat. The dog. That's it, that's it John was saying, helping his son to aim. Dog. Michael clicked, come here boy. With terrible slowness dog turned on his spindle legs toward his brother. As Michael crooned good, good boy the most awful sound emanated from somewhere inside the dog's throat the gurgled sound of attempts at human speech in between half-formed barks and whimpers. As the blast exploded through the air I passed out. When I came to the gunpowder smell was still heavy in the air. I groggily took in the scene, a lumpen mess on the floor that had once been dog, John, beaming at it, and Michael looking for once strangely serious, as if something had occurred to him just too late. As I slowly began twitching my fingers, urging any sort of movement out of my deadened body, John placed a hand on his son's shoulder and said it's finally over son. It's back to the way things were. 
For a moment, Michael looked at him, confused. Then he suddenly struck his hand hard with the butt of the gun against the wall. There was an audible crunch. My leg twitches. John looked genuinely hurt and went to grab the gun off his boy but he yanked it out of reach. Son, what are you? Stop that, Michael screamed, don't do that. I began to inch across the floor, pushing my dead weight body with weak leg thrusts. John lurched forward forcefully, give it to me you little. There was a second blast and John fell to the ground, screaming and hollering. Thick black smoke and a new, richer texture to the flesh smell wafted out. His whole foot was gone. Wasting no time, Michael leapt upon him on all fours, brandishing the little blade from earlier. John was crying and yelling as I pushed myself out of the doorway. Working fast, Michael carved through the Achilles tendon in his left ankle, which loosened with a slight pop John screamed again. I pushed through the jangly bead curtain. There was the sound of wrestling in the room, and more screaming. Son, for fuck's sake stop this. As I hobbled, half paralyzed onto my knees and opened the door I heard for the last time. Stop that. Dogs. Don't. Talk. The caravan was gone within days. My father didn't know what to believe when I tried telling him the story. I was delirious from shock and had to be taken to hospital. When my mother found out about the nights spent at hospital she flew in to take me back. I spent the next seven years systematically forgetting certain things about my time with my father. I managed to pick up at school after a long time spent as a suspected mute or something. Even made friends, eventually. I received little correspondence from my father. He remains at the same caravan park to this day. One day I got a call from him saying a young man had been by asking for me. He was sad to hear I no longer lived there. He asked to leave a message, went goes as follows. Dear Anon, it's been 15 dog years since we last met but I just wanted to let you know the old bitch is still kicking. I've made some big improvements since you last saw her. I hope everything's alright with you. I never heard of him again.